All right, this is Mortgage Fraud Explained, and what we're going to do is show you that the customer has a right to know the truth of what they're purchasing. I'm Denise Braley. I've been around white collar crime in the sense of um, explaining what white collar crime is, what we can do to fix it, uh, having at least during the early 2000s, meeting, 60 meetings um, with various regulators, 30 of which were with ASIC at the highest level of commissioner and deputy chair. So my career started in about 89, but all this is voluntary. I've been working to earn a living in between doing this voluntary. So the, the point is that the white collar crime we've unraveled in Australia through the help of other people such as Richard and others that are digging into this as well. Um, some of them say, yes, they're following my lead, but I've in invested the last 18 years just on the banks. Prior to that, I spent about 13 years on those that lost money that were retirees losing money in superannuation. We mentioned Storm, but there wasn't just Storm. When I worked with Jan Redfern, who was at the time the enforcement director in the early 2000s of ASIC, um, we had a list of 100 companies that were running promissory note, financial planning, rubbish investments, including the agri scams that you see later collapse. You don't hear about them. You think that was 2008, 2009. No, all this money was stolen in about the late 90s and early 2000s. So I just need you to know how far this goes back with no regulation of what they should be doing. The other thing that I mentioned that Richard said was asset stripping. At the moment, before the retires, we stripped completely of their superannuation. That was the target market. You've got to watch the target market. Are you the target market? Hands up at all those who know someone that's been affected by any of what we've been mentioning today. Yeah, that's pretty appalling. It brings a lump to my throat to see that. Because this is, well, I've spoken in New Zealand in about nine seminars over there. I've spoken in each state in Australia over the last 20 years. And I can assure you it's going on right now because no one is stopping it. The only one to stop it is the people. So the only way I can do that is get the message out to the people. What are the mechanics of this fraud? What should we be looking out for? What should we be doing better? What should we be asking questions about? So when we look at what I've got prepared for you here, this is not about asset stripping of commercial. That is in the farming sector, the small business, as Kate Carnell was saying. But this is also <coughs> asset stripping of at least two to three million homes of elderly people that worked all their lives to save for their own home and had that stripped by a bank within five years of having a knock on the door. Is that acceptable to you? No. no. no way. Is that below community standards? Yes. So I worked my butt off to get this Royal Commission, so, along with a lot of other people, of course, behind what I was doing. But uh, what a lot of people didn't know is I sent a letter to Bill Shorten because I'd written to Tony Abbott and spoke to his minder about this situation. And like was mentioned before, this was when Hockey was there. He said, oh, Denise, you've got to talk to Bill, to Joe Hockey, because he's going to have a roots and branch inquiry. One of the key criminals I was after was David Murray, uh, ex-Commonwealth Bank, thank you. And he is becoming the head of this. I thought, oh yes, we're on the same track. This has got to go. Right? This is where we've come to. So the, David Murray then was the Roots and Branch Inquiry. Oh no, Denise, we don't need a Royal Commission. An inquiry will do fine. So I do this, I cross the floor. Right, I'll talk to one side and then I'll talk to the other side. So I wrote a letter to Bill Shorten and gave him eight pages of why he needs a royal commission for his party. Not for you, for anybody else, but the party will do. That's a good enough excuse. 
and I get a call on a Sunday night, four days after they received that letter, and said three words that were music to my ears and should be to yours. Denise, we're running. Then I get a call from Chris Bowen's binder as well. Denise, we're running. And there was the lineup, 4th of the 4th, 2016. And you got your Royal Commission. So what happens? Then we've got both sides working out what they're going to do with this thing. And then Turnbull comes up in December with a bank flip, I call it, and says, we're going to run a Royal Commission. The trouble is we all know now what we've got. We've got one that's only looking below community standards. Hain is perfect. Rowena Orr is impressive. They're both high intellect people. But the terms of reference should be put in the bin. Yes. So are we stopping going on for a royal commission as a people, as a nation? No, we're not. We're going after a royal commission that lasts what I asked for in the first place. Two to three years, add the regulators onto it, add the receivers onto it from the business point of view. Add the politicians onto it. Add whoever needs to be in there to be exposed. Absolutely. Because this is where Australia's at. And what the problem is this, in meetings I've had. Yeah, but Denise, if we do that, we'll crash the economy. Well, if we're going to crash the economy, we've got a problem, haven't we? <laughs> this is where America fell in the hole. Right? America fell in the hole because it said, golly gosh, we're going to crash the economy. So therefore you had them, Bernanke and the others, and, and Gethner trying to sort out what they do in 2008, just a month before the inevitable crash, having one lot change underwear with the other lot change underwear, all their dirty laundries coming out to be washed. And yet the problem is that they didn't solve the problem because... They just allowed it to keep going. Only the people in Australia have got a chance, as Jeff was saying. Australia can do it because we are only 23 million people and we were made a convict, convict stock from the first place and we can get out of the blooming trenches and get on with the job and work out what it is. So the reason I've been called here is to explain to you what the actual mechanics were. Because even someone that rings me up on the phone and says, oh, Denise, I've got a mortgage and I'm in trouble. Can you help me? And then the first thing I start asking them, they know nothing about how they've been screwed. There is no other word in the vernacular to find for that. And these are dreadful stories. Dreadful stories that bring me to tears, I can tell you. So nothing you're told is in your best interests. The fraud is not just on the laugh. I taught everybody in about 2003 to go and look and demand from the bank the loan application form. How many here have got a mortgage? A few of you. You will not have a loan application in your file. You might think your mortgage is fine, but ask for the document. It's yours, your signature's on it, you want it. Guess what the banks were doing? They were asking, they were sending you out three pages. It's not a three page document, as I explained to the bank chiefs, because I do have meetings on uh, the executive level, I can assure you. They take me to lunch, we, we agree to disagree, and we have conversations. That's what we do. But I'm interested only in settlement of the people that are my members. That's what I do during my spare time. But the, the main thing is, it's an 11-page document where you never saw the other eight pages when you signed. So everybody says, oh, Denise says it's fraud. This is, this is big. This is fraud. My laugh, my, we call it the laugh, the LAF. My laugh shows you there's fraud. This is not my signature. It's an e-signature. This witness that signed to witness my signature, I've never heard of, never saw them. That is common. So what do you do when you've got a laugh and you've got that, you think immediately, aha, the broker is to blame. The bank manager is to blame. They set me up with this loan application form. I'm here to tell you today, no, that's only the start to get your juices running to know something's wrong. 
But the fraud is not on the left. That is part of the system from the top down, the top of the banks. Until you start looking at the top of the banks, you won't work it out. The banks, have you noticed how they're all busy at the moment? Blaming the brokers, right? Only 45% are sold with the brokers. So what happened to the 55% sold with the bank managers? Because they contain the same fraud. The fraud is in the approval process. All right? The approval process is the big deal. It's robo-approved. Did you know that? Does anybody in this room know that? For the last 15 years, every loan in Australia has been approved by a robot. Rubber stamp, approved, 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 approved. 150 billion normally a year. And one year, I rang APRA and said, at the executive level again, Oi, there's 200 billion this year, not 150 billion. I, you fake that, so I go on Twitter again. Social media, yes, as, as um, Barry was saying. Get on social media. I Twitter at least 20 tweets a day to amuse the public. The banks are my biggest uh, audience. They want to see whether they're named on there that morning. <laughs> right? Because the, the, I'm not telling you anything that we don't have evidence for. Nothing I'm saying today is there because there is no evidence. It's not good for my health to keep doing this. I'm 70 years old now. I want to retire. I'm getting, I'm getting cranky with the banks. Of course I am. I keep telling the deputy chair of ASIC, this is not my job. They should be doing it. Well, they get, four, they get at least 800 a year salary to do it. The fraud is in, contained firstly in the loan application form. The answers are contained in the mechanics and the control fraud is engineered from the top of the banking sector. So there's no enforcement of law in white collar crime. Don't worry about writing all this down. You can email me and I'll send you a copy. The consumer complaints are being ignored and the victims are offered poultry settlements not while I'm around, but they do normally get about 20 grand discount on the $500,000 mortgage. That is so that you can sign a deed for secrecy, do you mind? You help cover up the fraud. And you get a piss, piddly little $20,000? I don't think so. Not while I'm around. If there's a $200,000 deficit, that's what I want to see. So then I had a little thing in the paper one time when I questioned their figures. And it said, APRA has made an error because they have to send these figures to BIS every year, the Bank of International Settlements, and it was 150 billion. So when I rang up, they changed it to 200 billion, said, sorry, we made a, an error and had to tell BIS they, they can't get their figures right. We make it up as we go along. So they're sweeping white-collar crime under the table. That's what's going on. That's what Richard was saying about the regulators. There's 1.9 trillion in loan books. Now, we've seen several figures. Some say 1.6, some say... Take your pick. Right? Pick it out of the air. What we do know is we have the highest debt, second highest debt, in the world. Is that okay to you? No. Does that sound like we're going well? Now, the other big stat that APRA comes out with, 80% of mortgages, we say, are toxic interest-only law loans, according to the sellers. Who thought you should go and blame the brokers, blame the borrowers, their stupid old moves for getting sucked into this one. You blame everybody, but not the banks. Because if you blame the banks, it's going to impact our economy. So we'll just let the banks continue as normal. And they're sucking it out and pushing it over to the Cayman Islands. we got to wake up here. That's what's going on. So the, the APRA put out a stat of 40%. 40% of mortgages are toxic. Well, although the US are brilliant at putting out truths, to true stats, they put out, the, they only had 25% toxic loans at the height of the GFC, if that can be believed. So here we are in Australia saying we're only 24 million people, but yeah, we got the granddaddy, 40%, that's the highest in the world. 
But it's not, it's 80%. How do I know? I talk to the ones that are being blamed. I talk to the borrowers, I talk to the sellers. Guess what the sellers tell me? They've been conned too. They've been conned too, I know that. I've been banging on about that for years. But they tell me, Denise, we, we only had one product to sell, it was the IO. Everybody know what the IO is? Interest only. Either P and I or two. How is it sold like that? The brokers don't know. They're told to practice on their parents. Bang goes the inheritance. The siblings are upset. <laughs> so you end up with this problem, this big problem. And and I go to the sellers and I say, What sort of products do you sell? Oh, Denise, we all sell IOs now. We, were, we rarely sell P&I. People can't afford that. I thought, what? We, they can't even afford... That's the whole point. They can't afford the interest only. They're whacked in that with unaffordable loans, and that is the scam in a nutshell. Unaffordable loans, robo-approved. That's what we've got here in Australia. So the bank regulatory, regulator APRA spin on only 40% is now reduced to 30%. Oh, that's a good one. Let's just keep bringing it down to look as though we're working on it, boys and girls. So the regulatory failure is intentional. They can't have pesky regulators moving around into their business and causing problems, so they pay them too much to bother. Do you know what the pay if, payoff is for the average regulator up the top end? Well, I've caused 14 to enjoy it. I wish I could have it myself. You wish you could have it yourself. If they get too much trouble through what I'm doing in the media, then they get sent over to Asia for three years to work in one of the regulatory environments there for one million a year for three years tax-free. Nice? <laughs> right. Why aren't you on the list? <laughs> okay, so they love me down at ASIC because I'm likely to give them the grand prize. They speak too much about what Denise is saying and they get shoved over to Asia. So the regulators, APRA and APRA, have shuffled down to monitoring. That's all we do, monitor. I was criticising this in 2001. ASIC is useless, it's just monitoring. I don't want somebody to monitor, I want them to get in there and do something about it. So the Lodox is just a name, just understand that. So in 2016, the current government announces, oh, we don't call them Lodox anymore. That's what happened in America. The Lodox in America are not uh, safe. We used to do them, we don't do them anymore. So now they call them IOs, interest only. The problem was, each person that rings me, I say to them, is this an I.O.? What's that? No, no, we just got a mortgage. See, they paid off their home for 30 years with a mortgage. That's what it was called, was it not? You don't have Viridian lines of credit. You didn't have this and that, super titles to things. You just had a mortgage, a home loan. Is that not right? So people didn't question it. They got a home loan. The broker didn't even explain it. He just said, I'll get you a mortgage. Sign here. Press hard, three copies. Right. So everybody's enveloped in, enveloped in this particular type of uh, product. All loans were approved by the computer. But you had to put an income in the box, remember? I'll go into the income as to how they pulled that one off in a moment. So there were no verification details. They've admitted this to me. ASIC have admitted this in private meetings. Oh yeah, Denise, there hasn't been verification for years. They don't verify the details. Remember they used to ring your employer to check that you actually exist? Oh, they don't do that. All they're after is the value of your asset. Why? Because they're asset stripping. Asset stripping is a criminal offence. Asset stripping takes 10 years out of your life if you get caught or if some government has the political will to take action. That's what the problem is. 
So the lending policy guidelines that they have, and I've got every version, I think, of each bank, they have a ticker box system. And they keep saying to me, oh, Denise, according to the lending policy guidelines um, at the turn of the century, I said, listen, whatever version you're talking about, I'm not interested in your lending policy guidelines because you guys just put it out and never followed it anyway. This is what I tell the executives. So the Chi then Chinese liar loans, I'll just briefly capture that. Can you imagine a load of people like you that are Chinese in China probably don't speak English, maybe, but you go to a seminar like, like this in Shanghai, run by the Westpac Bank, the NAB, the CBA. They're all into it. They send over Australian Chinese that are conversant in Mandarin. And they run a seminar like this and get everybody signed up into Australian houses, sight unseen, what is it, 12,000 miles away or whatever it is, and you are then trapped using your own home. So once again, they're fishing. They just want people that own an asset, their own home, that's all. And they'll whip it off you in five years. You'll lose it. That's the plan. Heaven help us if the Chinese decide that they're not too happy with us doing that. But anyway, we'll see what comes of it. So you've got a Ponzi going here, as Richard was talking about Ponzi financing. That's what this is. It's robbing Peter to pay Paul. They'll steal the assets, your own home. And they, they, they have an army of people going after the borrower by knocking on the door or a phone canvassing. These are paid by the banks. The... Triple A, Moody's, at the moment, their ratings, as you saw in the big short, are just a sham. They don't actually research anything. They just pick up a fee for putting a triple A sticker on. Where do you get the stickers from? The banks. <coughs> so they're all marked triple A. Good luck with figuring that one out. And the RMBS packages, I won't go into that, but I raised that on the 8th of August 2012 in Parliament. The senators were flummoxed, didn't quite know what I was talking about. Even if they knew, one or two did know about mortgage-backed securities, my question was, a very valid one when you think about it that time, what percentage of your loan book is in these packages because this is being sold to the Americans? the superannuation funds, the big hitters that will come down and screw the ants, the, sue the, uh, the pants office down here with their lawyers. We could be hit for, with 50 billion very shortly. But in the big short, there's a big um, scene where the traders are sitting around the room going through boxes. Who's seen that movie? Do, do you remember that, that scene where they're going through the boxes? Who bought this crap? That was their words. Who bought this? Who bought, th who the, who bought this? Oh, that's gone to Dusseldorf. Oh, that's gone to Germany. So Anna Merkel's bought all this stuff. This has been going on for years. America's laughing because it sold all its rubbish to Germany. But who did? So I was on the war path in Parliament. I wanted to know who we sold our stuff to. Well, it was America, so round it goes. <laughs> so the subprime mortgage market, we talk about Ponzi. There's Charles there. He ended up, forget his little misdemeanors in the postage game with Ponzi financing, if you have a, a need to read it it's quite interesting what he did but later what he did was he carried on and become a banker the very fashionable mr charles ponzi with the top hat and cane he was only about that high and he just went round and got third of the boston police force to invest in him because he was the financial guru of his time in the 1920s this is just before the crash he was just doing what goldman sachs were doing he knew the game, he just played it and bought his own bank with the money he'd stolen off the other people, the retirees in the first place, and then picked up all the pensioners with their homes. This is all a hundred years ago. Nothing new. Just, I, I actually went to university at one stage of my life, and in the 90s, and I remember talking to my professor and I said, I want to, actually, I've been doing 20 years in white-collar crime, even at that stage, I want to study white-collar crime. I want to do criminology, which is what I was doing. Oh, he said, Denise, there's not a lot of material, uh, empirical evidence on white-collar crime in Australia. I thought, well, what the hell am I doing? 
Anyway, we get through that, and that is what made me then go on further, because then I had degrees behind me in law, in politics. That was so I could talk to the politicians and then realise I hadn't done the course. That's another story. <laughs> so the point was, I, I was able, as an educated woman, to then go in, in these corridors of power and talk and talk and talk to try and find a better way forward. So everything came cr crashing down with, and we, we've done the Chinese liar loan, so I'll just leave that, but they, they've left them with, there's about um, 350,000 of them. They run to the Indonesians before they run to the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, those people are going to get pretty upset. There's a history of Lodox, and the property bubbles are bursting. And we know that. They're bursting around the globe, as Richard touched on. So it's the same as 29, 83 and 08. The age of technology. I've had Americans ring me up saying, Denise, you've been doing this, uh, th this sort of stuff in America. I've been down there to try and figure it out, but you guys have been doing it longer than we have, and you're still going. We don't know how you do that. You're doing exactly the same thing as we did. Well, I'll tell you how they did it. We were much cleverer than that. We decided that we would hit ARIPs, Asset Rich Income Poor. I was at a Macquarie Bank seminar as a VIP guest sitting front row. Bill Moss leaned over and said, you will behave, Denise. I said, on this occasion for you, Bill, yes, I will. And the treasurer was actually the speaker. And the treasurer is telling a thousand financial planners in the room to go and look for new markets and hit on ARIPs. He used a little old lady in Chatswood as an example of sitting on a million dollar block of land, which is more like two million now. And this was in 2005. So all these financial planners were just lapping all this stuff up that this is what they've got to do to make themselves wealthy. They've got to go and find new targets, ARIPs, asset rich, income poor, people on a pension, that's fine. It all gets robo-approved. You get the picture? Okay. That's going to make Australia great again because there's going to be more money circulating in, in rather than a little old lady and gent sitting on their property and not investing it. So we'll go and take it off them. And they'll be dead shortly anyway, so who cares? So Australia now has the second highest household debt levels in the world. The key integrator of these aggressive selling techniques are being used, and the property bubbles can lead to um, ca catastrophic economic issues. So the spiel, this is the spiel, the biggest financial decision you'll ever make you rely on the truth and confidence. They develop low-risk strategies for you. Low-risk, remember that one? The, the spiel suggests safest houses. And they also say, don't leave dead equity in your house. Has anyone heard that one? Yeah. Pull it out of there. Not good for you. Oh, <laughs> horrible stuff. Negative gearing advantages. Well, this is what I was, I did go and meet Bill Short, and I, I just couldn't understand how negative gearing really helps anyone because a lot of these loans are, he was horrified, a lot of these loans that I'm talking about, hundreds, hundred, thousands of them across Australia, how does anyone on a pension get a negative gearing tax advantage? Can anyone explain that to me? But see, the seller doesn't understand that. And the buyer doesn't understand it. It sounds all wonderful, as though they're getting good strategies, good financial advice, and it's got the bank's logo. The four big banks, their logos are on all over these documents. And when you get a valuation, if you're lucky, that they don't want to show you, it's actually sponsored, the reports, the annual reports, are sponsored by the major banks. Their logos are all over it. So you trust the income will not be manipulated after you sign, do you not? You trust the regulators will be for enforcing the law. The consumers realise that mortgage fraud is now a bank-driven conception. And that's what I'm uh, explaining this morning. It's a bank-driven thing. You know, from the top of the bank, you have now been left unprotected and there's no enforcement of law. Good luck to you. 
So the fraud on the mortgage lasts, the loan application forms, I'll just run through this quickly because I've done some of this before, but then when they come to sign the contracts, there's a six minute sign up with yellow stickers. They got six, they don't get time to read this contract. Why didn't you read your contract, you stupid consumer? They didn't even get time. They'll say, oh, blow in. The brokers are taught and the bank managers. Just blow in. Tell them you've got another appointment because time is money. You've got a quota this month. You've got to earn your commissions. So you've got to get out to the next appointment. Don't oversell it. You've already sold them on it. They just got to sign the contract. Six minutes, you're gone. Six minutes sign up is all over Australia. Every bank, every state. Sellers are not experienced in the contracts. They're told, do not answer any questions on the contracts because you're dumb sods and you don't know what to answer anyway. Well, that solves that problem for the bank. So there's no opportunity for the customer to read and understand. And back at the office, these people are told, do not show the borrower the other eight pages, whatever you do. And they never get a copy of the three pages they signed. The level of toxic subprime in the mortgage market is 80% of the loan book, as we've talked about. The big question is, how many toxic loans are really in our banking system? In 2005, bankers admitted on TV, when it was my questions again through Alan Kohler, they answered 60%. Then in 12, when I took it to Parliament, they're saying it's only 10, one said 10 and the other said 12%. And in 2016, bankers told APRA 40%. Now they're saying it's 30%. But the expert economists that I'm talking to on a regular basis tell me we're on the money. It's around 60 to 80 at least. Fraudulent fake APRA stats. And I keep telling APRA, give us your stats. They even rang me a few months ago and said, Denise, this service calculator you're talking about that fudges the income, can we have a copy of that? I said, well, you'll have to ask the bank for that because it's a bank program. He said, oh, isn't it a disk you put in the laptop, the brokers put in the... I said, no, it's a bank calculator. It's designed by the bank computerised IT whiz kids down there and what they do is put it onto your laptop. You go in with a password. If you want the passwords to all the banks, give me an email and I'll send them to you. I've got them all. So who are the external bank auditors? Well, that's another problem. They've never released the names of the, account, the big four accountants that are doing, by law, must be two external bank audits per year per bank. Two. How many are they doing? Well, we haven't seen one yet. And then APRA came up with a, 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 a press release and said, we're now going to get heavy and we're going to get the banks to audit these figures. I thought, what? By law, they're supposed to, you can't send them to the BIS until they've done two external. This is just shocking. This is shocking. And they're saying there's not a problem. The people were not told the loans were interest only. And thousands of these loans were sold to pensioners, but the biggest one is the line above. If an IO is not affordable on a day one, it will never be affordable. So how did these people on a pension pay these things apart from having rent? You actually can't use rent in law if it's a projection. Under the code, did you know the banker's code they tried, the bank went into court recently in the case of Rice three years ago, Rose it was, and said, oh, the bank lawyer said, but the code, Your Honour, is not a law. Well, the, Your Honour dis disagreed and said, no, it's definitely in law, and I suggest you tell your client that, and bang, found in favour of the customer. Thank goodness. We've won about nine cases through getting funding for cases to set precedents. So not satisfied with that, it went to another one called Doggett, and I wrote a 20-page report to Commissioner Hain for the latest round of Royal Commission. And you can all have a copy of that if you email me, I'll send you a copy of the report. But Hain is using that. I've, I've heard him use it now, all the things I've put down for him, just dot point. It's not referenced at all, it's just got dot point what this is all about. But that particular Doggett 
Did you know every mortgage in Australia, because the CEOs sign for the code every year, did you know that? You do now. And they warrant, according to the courts, the judges have agreed that the warrant is that no loan in Australia should be unaffordable. Well, funny about that, isn't it? Now, how much is it going to cost Australia for all these cases to suddenly start being processed to throw a bit of fairness in there? This is fairly big stuff. The 30-year bridging loan can never pay off the loan. They didn't know it was a bridging loan. Do we, do, do we all remember the name bridging? Yeah. Well, that was never used in the sales bill. If people had been told this is a bridging loan, they would have understood. And if you think reverse mortgage is a good idea, I'm not bailing you out of that one. That's just plain stupid. So neither sellers nor borrowers discovered the significance. It's a trap. The mortgages were sold as a trustworthy bank product. The people fell for it because they trusted the big bank logos. And a 30-year loan mortgage suitable for low-income users. That's how it was, uh, that's how it was uh, sold. So you never own your own home if you bought an investment property using your own house as, a, as equity and security. So it was Greg Medcraft in America that set up the American Securitization Association. He's the one that brought this genius down to Australia. And he became head of the corporate cop. I love that one. And he, 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 the people were only paying off interest but there was, in five to ten years, it was to change to P&I. Well, people can't afford to, to change to P&I. But how on a pension did they afford the shortfalls? Because there was always shortfalls in the actual interest-only loans. And the only way they could afford that was to be able to put the P&I on the table. Uh, sorry, to cha if they, without changing it to P&I. They were giving them lines of credit, credit cards extra personal loans. So for five years to make the mortgage-backed securities look secure, the payments always came in on time and went to the American insurance funds for, for their investment as investors, if you're investing in these bonds. But the, the money that's coming into these bonds is not going to help you because if suddenly something happens, all of that is fake money. The people are not paying it from income. When you are an investor and you look at the prospectus into bonds, you think that the payments will be paid on time. Do you not? Or you wouldn't invest. You don't know that the payments are made on time. Oh, like clockwork for five years by the banks because our banks are borrowing on lines of credit from the wholesale um, money markets. And they're feeding the money for the shortfalls into the pockets of the pensioners so that that doesn't come to light in the nightly news. It's a Ponzi. So the bankers that we're showing you, this was all at the top level. Most of the executives on even the level underneath the top level did not know what the fraud was. It's very clever because everybody had a component and something to do. They didn't know what the whole thing was. They might have seen peculiarities, but the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing and the ones under were told nothing. But it's an intention to deceive, which is a criminal act. I wrote a report for the White Collar Crime Inquiry, which one of the senators got up and running. And in that report, I said, bankers, if they're acting as a cartel, then immediately what that must happen is that they be given, found guilty, 25 years, not 10 years, which is the current criminal um, provision, and a stripping of all assets and no parole. That's my idea of justice. Yes. So we know the bankers at the top of the culprits. There's no doubt about that. The evidence is all trickling up to the top. The uh, tar, uh, the there's only the brokers only and the financial advisors. Did you know they only get 30 hours tuition? 
how to fill in a form and fill in a calculator. So the service calculator, which I'm speaking about at the moment, um, the, the service calculator is in a program, as I said, in the actual laptop. So that's what makes an, a pensioner or low-income family whose income might be up to fifty or $60,000 a year income, and the same happens with the farmers, but in higher proportions. The actual figures that are put into the calculator, the algorithms on the calculator, uh, show that they're manipulating the, the income so that on the laugh, the, the uh, seller is told to write, and the bank manager, told to write, your income is 150 grand. This is on the eight pages you didn't see. In every case in Australia, 2,000, 3,000 people I've looked at in 18 years, every loan application form is the same. No one received a copy of the loan application form. The banks don't want you to have it. We've had to fight to get those out. And I don't want the three-page version. I want the whole eight, uh, 12 pages. And I want a copy of the calculator, and they don't want to give you that at all. So they're hitting on the asset rich, income poor. And, it, and then they developed an RV of business development managers and coaches, bank coaches. Who's heard of the bank coaches in business? There's heaps of them, right? And these people were there to make sure the rest of you got the advice you needed. But it was crook, crooked advice. It was only to stitch you up, providing you had an asset. What is asset stripping? It's where you deliberately don't tell them what the risk is. And, 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 and people are just fooled. So the BDMs go out and teach the sellers simply two things. How to use the service calculator. And, and some of the brokers have said to me, oh, look, I asked about that and said, why should we put $150,000 income on the sheet when the person we know has only got 50 grand on a pay slip or whatever or a pension? They said, oh, no, don't you worry about that. That's our problem. Uh, you just put the 150 down because that's how it works to get the loan across the line. And this is a bank calculator that adds, they say, it adds on all the addbacks and add-ons, the accounting, the negative gearing. You wouldn't be able to do that. You're not at that level. So the computer does it for you. It's the bank computer. That's how it happens. It's intentional. It's global. And we have it here in Australia in a big way. The banks recruited this army of sellers, and I said they had their target market, and the fraud and the robo-loans were what drove it. And then we get to the complaint handling uh, service uh, system, which was also shot to bits. FOSS was just paid five grand by the banks per customer to just give a 20 grand discount to make it go away, but sign a deed of confidentiality that it would never take it to court. Pretty awful. Pretty awful. So the financial strategy has always been to increase your debt and, to, and, and with the farmers, they were telling them to buy extra stock. I said this in the parliamentary inquiry here in Perth for the uh, primary producers. Uh, I gave evidence on the 19th of July last year. And to buy extra stock, they told this poor farmer, he wanted to borrow about, well, he wasn't poor. He wanted to borrow, though, another four million because he was going to put it into another diversified industry for the coming two, two or three years because they knew a drought was imminent. Bank says, we'll give you six million on one condition. You buy an extra million dollars worth of cattle. He said, why would I buy cattle coming into a drought season? Why would I do that? Well, if you want the six million, that's what you've got to do. True story, I read it out in Parliament. I know the person, I've spoken to him, I know him well. So this is a pump and dump method of whatever they're doing. The mortgage loan market is based on trust and confidence in the system. The borrowers do not, do not suspect every, anything at all. And you risk an average, what we've done is we looked at the tracker. The tracker is the computerized Thing, another document they won't give you, about 10 pages long, that is that they were, 
The banks were pretty upset when they found I managed to get uh, uh, copies of the trackers out of the banks. We did get them out, some of them. But these trackers track exactly the process of how you get screwed all the way down the line. And it's doing one set period only, the period from the day you sign the life to the approval to the payout of the, the settlement of the loan over a three-week period. So we want the trackers now. We're on the track, and we want the trackers for every single person in Australia. Like it or lump it. And the average loss to most Australians, the average loss in our work, um, in the number of people we've spoken to and, and collected data on, is about $200,000 per person. And there's a copy of the tracker. You won't be able to read it, but that's what it generally looks like. And that's where the asterisks are where they've actually hyped up the valuations. They're where all the errors are. So look at page one of the errors. False information on the bank's own computerised processing centre system. A and Z have been smart. They've sent all their computerised processing system now over to India. Good luck with complaining there. So the grand plan was to steal the home and assets, the farmers, everybody, small business, set people up in businesses with a business coach that have never had a business before. But one thing was common, use your asset that you worked hard for, your property. It's about property. They're after any property you've managed to get, whether you inherited it, you worked for it, you've got it, they want it. And that was what the seminar with Macquarie was all about in 2005, that they'd been running since the late 90s. Okay, so they knew the engineered service ca calculator was, was a bad one, but they were telling people, we're going to turn your equity into debt so you can make more money. Yeah. The control fraud, the setup is carried out in the approval process. So a lot of those I've told you before about the top-ups, the buffer loans, they would give every person in Australia $50,000 extra debt so you could pay the payments with that money. And if that ran out, they'd give you another 50. Have you heard recently what happens in Australia when, when all these things start to get, start, start to unravel, what are we going to do in the future when all these IO loans with five years, each year that means you've got a, thousands of these loans, if not a couple of million of them floating about in the system, you've got all these loans suddenly being turned into P&I. Because then the contract says you'll pay a higher interest rate of 12, 14%. Well, good luck with that. So all those are going to collapse, but they're out of the, uh, the bond market with that particular mortgage by then, so they don't care. And that's where they'll foreclose and come and grab your house for repossession. That's what they're up to. But all of that stuff that's going is, is actually becoming a real problem. So using debt to pay payments each month, everybody was on a drip feed. And then there was FOSS, the Ombudsman Service. Well, I just wrote a 14-page report last year to Ian Ramsey as part of that review, and I sent it into the Treasury as well, giving them 14 pages of why FOSS needs to be demolished. It's utterly corrupt. So they say the broker is the agent of the borrower. That's nonsense in law. Courts have ruled on that. The broker is the agent of the bank under the master-servant laws. The LVR is manipulated, the loan-to-value ratio. The, um, the cost of the loan mortgage insurance is a scam. Did you know the banks are all self-insuring now? Yeah. On your settlement statement, it'll, the, if you've got an LMI figure there, it won't say LMI, it'll just say risk fee, seven grand. Oh, but the banks told ASIC, because ASIC commissioner told me, Denise, the banks, I've had discussions with them, and they're going to make it cheaper for consumers by not using QBE or GE anymore. <laughs> well, you know what happened to that? The LMI rose in cost up to 14000 not seven. And the banks are self-insuring. How, how stable are these banks? And that's why they can't pay any, they, they've self-insured, so they can't pay out the payouts. 
So the cost of living is, is also raised in Parliament because I raised the point again of the HPI. No, everybody thought the banks keep saying we use the HEM for the cost of living. They didn't ask you for a list of expenses. They just said we'll give one size fits all. So they used the HEM, which was the um, Bureau of Stats uh, uh, home, um, what is it, the home measure, yeah. home household expenditure. Household expenditure, thanks Richard, I knew you'd know it. Household expenditure and, uh, m measure. But what I found, it had HPI on all these laughs. Do you know what HPI means? Obviously, Henderson Poverty Index. Henderson Poverty Index. They wanted you all on bread and water to afford to pay this loan that you couldn't afford anyway. So it brought down the cost of living to about 18 grand for a couple. And the kids were only worth five grand each. And other things I found on there, people that had six kids were put down as zero kids, so you didn't add them on to the cost of living. Who wants to pay for kids? Especially grown-up ones. But the futuristic incomes are, are, are just not sensible. So you've got all these things going on inside the bank to work it out as a map, a mud map. This is giving you a general eye. There's fraud on the loan application. The broker doesn't know about the fraud, so he's just presenting it to the couple. The only thing the bank are after, which is the bank's target with the fraud, is to grab your house and put you in a cardboard box later on. And meantime, you're going to get loaded with debt. It's unaffordable, unsustainable, unverified, and approved by the bank robot. So this is a, a, just one sheet. I'll just show you. You can't read it, but it gives you an idea. This is a, an older style, but loan app. This is a, this is a, um, a, a service calculator. And so at the bottom, you see two asterisks there. It says loan is serviceable. That comes up as a big red light in front of the broker saying, yippee, you've just earned your commission. Your loan is serviceable. And off it goes to the processing center where they fiddle with it a bit more. And the math, this is the average math I'm dealing with, with the net income 50 grand, the existing mortgage eight, 30,000 cost of living. Um, uh, you know, with two kids to support, which is more like 48,000. They've got it down as 30. They say it gives you a $10,000 surplus, but going to stitch you up with a new commitment of an investment property of 33,600. And it was selling all these people that own their own home the idea that they could save for their retirement by getting an investment property and putting a tenant in there. A lot of these properties in mining towns and they haven't got tenants. The whole thing is a sham. So the additional scams used by bankers in the mortgage fraud is all driven by commissions and it's pump up the volume. There's no mention that the income stream is securitized in RMBS junk bonds. And they've got ABNs in for a day. They had to show you were a sophisticated investor. So some of these people aged 80 or 90 got stuff in the mail to say they've now got an ABN number. I said, what's this? Oh, oh it's just what you need to get the loan. No business. So the purchase price is always higher than the valuation. And that's how they pull it off. The loss is about, in that example, is about $175,000 plus costs. And the bank costs for running that loan was $134,000. You think the bank's not making any money out of this? If the house is sold for a loss, how do they make money? That's how they make their money. <laughs> and they then will come after you for life for a debt with the debt collectors and so a banking cartel one of the last ones I'll go through the banking cartel we've got a banking cartel right now now I'll show you exactly why I know we've got a banking cartel I put it in the report to uh, Commissioner Hayne so he, you've seen him on TV he's quite impressive is he not he looked the banker straight in the eye. He likes to look to the left and he likes to look to the right and he spot on to the witness. And he said, are you acting as one? Did anyone hear him do this? Mm -hmm. it's, it's on the, it's televised, of course. <coughs> and the guy mumbled, the banker, mid-executive mid level. He mumbled around, he didn't want to answer that one. I'll ask you again, are you acting as one? And more mumble. 
I will ask you one more time, are you acting as one? The actual answer was, well, no one wants to be first horse out of the box. Think about it, that's the answer. All the banks are doing the same thing. They're acting as a, as a cartel because they're all, the forms are the same. The training to the brokers are the same. The training to the sellers are the same, whether it's bank managers or whatever. They're all doing the same process of approval, the robo-approval. They're not taking any notice of the risk to the people. No notice of the risk to the economy. No notice because if they come, it, it's read the book, too big to fail. The banks become too big to fail. Well, I don't think that's going to happen in Australia. If we've got to pull at least one bank down, we've got to turn another one into a national bank and make the other two behave by joining in as the only bank left standing. That's what's going to happen. So we wrote to Treasury in 2016 and re with the, 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 the report and then we looked into the cartel. It, did you know that there is a CCMC, a, a Code of Compliance Monitoring Committee, but the Code of Compliance Monitoring Committee has somebody above that pulling the strings like a puppet. I thought, who the stuff are these CCMC codes? Well, guess who they are, ladies and gentlemen? They are the 16 bankers running the cartel. So they say you can't look, the FOSS Ombudsman Service cannot look into anything that is a risk to the bank or in terms of their lending practices. It's bank business, not your business. So the regulators are simply operating a monitor, and I've called it many times, the ASIC is operating, which Richard covered, they're operating just a doom loop within the EDR system. So you've got your cartel, cartel there, you've got ASIC and FOSS compliant with everything, the banks are just taking hold of the, of the actual houses, and the little... Uh, so, uh, you know, ASIC is just saying your many breaches of many breaches of corporate regulation deserve serious consequences. So no pudding for you. <laughs> so APRA and ASIC tell the Parliament there's no systemic issues. So this gets me really riled. I'm fed up of hearing no systemic issues from our regulators that are pulling in 450 million a year. Our budget for BFCSA, there's no money for me, is about 10 grand a year. That's what we run it on. My budget doesn't even compare with those. I told that to the deputy chair of ASIC one time and he said, oh, Denise, if you had our budget, you'd be positively dangerous. <laughs> so the stats are showing the subprime, we think, is around $137 billion worth of loans the last couple of years sold per annum. We think that's a fake stat. It's probably closer to $200 billion. So in five years, you can work out you're already up to $1 trillion. And all these loans are sloshing around right now in the system. The ASIC reporting constantly that there's no systemic issues. And I've reported all of the above that I've explain, explained to you that there's just hypothetical incomes put on the, the, the loans. And the banks are saying, you're allowed to use a hypothetical figure. Well, under the code 25.1 now 27.1 no you can't use a hypothetical so if there's no tenant in the house when you buy uh, get a loan using your home as security to buy an investment property you cannot use a hypothetical figure of what a tenant might pay if you get a tenant but that's what the banks are doing so the um the bank will be liable for misleading and deceptive conduct by the broker now, they've been denying they, that that will happen for years. So the banks have been in the blame game. They've blamed everybody. They blame the Chinese. They call all the borrowers liars. Remember that? Liars' lines? That's to try and make you think that they're all the liars. They're all the, um, those people. We've made 21 submissions. It's actually 23 now. To 22 inquiries, which we called for and lobbied for. We've lobbied successfully for a Royal Commission and we're not satisfied with it, so we'll continue with that lobbying to get a full Royal Commission for you. 
and the people aged 60 plus who own their home and have no debt, you are the biggest market threat. You are the ones that will, somebody will try and go after. But the more this comes out, please be generous with those that went before you and didn't know any of this and have been caught. We need compassion here. You wouldn't know all this if I wasn't compassionate. I didn't do it for my health. I'm not getting paid for doing this. And I do it because there's an issue at stake here that is much greater than me or anyone else in this room. And that's why I need you to understand that whilst we've got this Royal Commission on the go, whilst we've got CEC doing a magnificent job of pushing for Glass-Steagall, the fact is that between, um, they will tell you that between 1933, Glass-Steagall, and 1983, uh, 50 years, we had peace in banking. We actually had decent regulation that we think was working okay. Am I right, Faith? Yeah. Yeah. But after the deregulation, we don't need to go back to who came up with deregulation because they've already said, oh, that was a bad move. We were all okay with LBJ. Remember that? We were all following America. We're all going to get rich together. We, we, don't, we don't gain any miles by going back. We've got to go forward in our thinking of what we do about this problem. But we've got to recognise the consumers are distressed, they're mired in debt, and that also takes the, the actual problem away from the people that thought they were going to get those, uh, those, all that inheritance. And the government's in denial. It's now saying uh, manufacturing is producing inferior loan products and disturbing outcomes. We're saying that. But the problem is the banks are still manufacturing the product. The, the, the main changes need to be made. The customer ought to receive a full copy of the laugh, the copy of the calculator, a copy of the tracker, a copy of the valuation. They ought to be initialed by the borrowers on every page they sign. The customers must be asked if they prefer I.O. and or P&I and explain what that is. And all risks must be properly explained and if there's predatory efforts in spruiking people by going and knocking on their door it's immediate the bank has to cancel that loan completely and wear the loss and I've won that argument with them face to face on many occasions the affordability can only be based upon net income on day one and not with fudgy phony figures and the only way forward is an extended royal commission thank you for listening